Child pornography. It is not a victimless crime. Every child sexual abuse image and video is a crime scene. These are real children, real families, real victims. The film you're about to watch is a wake-up call. Too often these crimes are never detected or reported. Even when the child predators in Minnesota are caught producing, trading, or viewing child sexual abuse imagery, they are rarely severely punished. Why? Because Minnesota has some of the weakest sentencing guidelines for convicted users of child sexual abuse imagery in the United States. Is Minnesota becoming a catch and release state for predators? Is Minnesota becoming a sanctuary state for vicious criminals? How can this be? How can a state like Minnesota, which claims to care about its children, continue releasing these predators back on the streets where they can harm more children. For the next few minutes, you will hear from law enforcement, mental health professionals, and a victim's mother whose daughter was groomed and violated by a trusted adult male. You will hear about the child sexual abuse problem in Minnesota that can no longer be ignored. Minnesota currently is one of the worst in the nation as far as holding sexual predators accountable for their actions, for their crimes. These are horrible, these are horrible crimes. They're of the most horrible crimes. But then when you take and you apply that to children being victimized by these sexual predators, that should, not, that should not sit well with anybody. Nobody should turn a blind eye to that. Nobody should say, that's not my child. Or, that's not hidden close enough to home. Minnesota is among the worst for holding sexual predators accountable, especially when it comes to child rape and torture, video and imagery, child pornography. When my daughter started sixth grade at the middle school, she was 12. She was the class president of her sixth grade class. She had so many friends and was just a lively child, just loving school and life. And she met the assistant principal there and he kind of took her, took her under his wing. He would call her down from class uh, pretty much every day to do something. She would charge her cell phone in his office. Uh, she met someone online, um, a, a child from Duluth, supposedly, and she would talk to the assistant principal about this. And they would, you know, kind of, he would give her advice, try to keep the relationship going, tell her that, you know, this was all normal, what he was doing, asking for inappropriate pictures, that type of thing was normal, that's just what kids do. I got a call from the sheriff's department saying that my daughter had been um, in some type of a relationship with an adult male, and he told me that it was the assistant principal who was posing as this child and receiving inappropriate pictures from my daughter. That same day was the day that he was arrested and he had his arraignment the next day. At that time, it was thought that he would only receive probably probation. Well, we would be lucky if he was to get any jail time at all. It was just looked at as um, inappropriate at that time and not much more. I don't think I've ever been more angry this is something that just devastated, devastated my child and my whole family. And the thought of him being released and in the community that we still needed to live in and work in was just unreal to me. I thought, we, we need to move. We need to, we need to leave the state. We need to get out of here. There's no way that I can be, you know, walking through the grocery store and having this man show up there. If you're convicted in, in state prison, 
Um, you, you do minimal time. Uh, good time is uh, put into play. Whereas if you get convicted at the federal level, let's say you get convicted of a 10-year crime, they sentence you to 10 years, you'll do the 10 years. When you think about uh, Nicole's story about her daughter being victimized by someone who was preying on them, preying on uh, young teenage children, If it had been, if this individual would have been uh, convicted and sentenced under Minnesota guidelines, that individual would have received a, a stay of adjudication, a presumed stay. And if there would have been any kind of any kind of uh, time behind bars, it would have been spent more than likely local, small amount of time, local jail time. That's it. And. For me to have these young people who have been victimized by that individual, to know that that person is out on the street on a presumed stay after they, after that, after he victimized these young, these young children, there's no justice for them. There's no, there's no justice for these victims because they're constant, constantly looking over their shoulder. She's a completely different person. She was a straight A student. She was captain of the swim team. She was class president. Now she doesn't go to school. She does alternative education, I'm really struggling with that. She doesn't do any activities. She's withdrawn. She's really suspicious of men. She has lost all of her trust for adults. She, she wants to never be in that position again. And to do that, she realizes she can't trust anybody. These victims have a tough enough time healing as it is. They spend the rest of their life trying to heal. Now, being a victim of this type of crime, you never really have a good opportunity to heal. Because in the back of their, not, in the back of their mind for the rest of their life, they're thinking about that video. They're thinking about that imagery that is out there in the dark web. And that is being played over and over and over again. That crime against that child is, is out there forever. It is a lifelong impact. Though some people that haven't studied it, haven't worked with survivors might think, well, it was just a minor thing. It is not a minor thing. Until you've worked with, and until you've looked in the eyes of survivors and seen how difficult a time they have trying to adjust in the future and trying to have meaningful relationships, trying to rebuild trust, where they spend year after year trying to figure out, was it their fault? Was it something about them? Then you'll understand why we need to have our sympathies toward the survivors, not the predators. The predators need help but they need help behind bars. Survivors need to know that society understands and stands with them. Through my years of being an investigator and dealing with child sex crimes, uh, it took a toll on me mentally, emotionally, and physically, uh, right down to uh, my home life. I had a hard time uh, you know, communicating with my wife after I had been 12 hours in front of a computer, uh, get, uh, going through evidence to present to prosecution that we knew defense was gonna be wanting to look at. And when you have to look at that day in and day out, what's happening to, from a 12 month old child on up to, well, once they re reach puberty, it's, uh, it's amazing what, what, what's going on out there and nothing's getting done. Warning, the next part of this story contains graphic and disturbing details. We include this because Minnesotans simply have to know what is happening to their children. Minnesota laws for prosecuting child sex offenders absolutely must be changed. Your imagination can really 
run wild on something like this. I mean, I, I can almost say I've, I've seen everything. Um, I believe I only did it for five or six years, just mainly the child sex crimes. But uh, the one that made me uh, demote myself, if you say, uh, back to the road was uh, there was a, about a four minute video that I had to review where a adult male, roughly probably in his late 40s, early 50s, took a broom handle to a 12 to 24 month old child, inserted it into her vagina and lifted her off the ground to a point the child was screaming and bleeding. That was the one that uh, I had turned my resignation into my uh, sheriff requesting a transfer back to the road. By the time a man gets into the prison system, those who've offended, they have a history, a long history of involving themselves in pornography. That really is the key to understanding a pedophile or a sexual predator. From their own admission and self-disclosure, that underneath all offending is pornography. And that is what the general public does not understand, that by the time a man offends, by the time a man is discovered, he has spent years causing himself to go down a certain path where he becomes very, very different. His mind changes, his brain changes. There's been studies that have shown that the brain will change if you saturate it with pornography. It becomes what amounts to psychopathic. There's very close similarities between the brain scans of white collar psychopaths and those that offend. The power of porn will change the brain so by the time a man becomes deviant, he's already morphed into somebody that is very different, though he looks the same on the outside. He has become a predator. In 2016, law enforcement was called to investigate a trailer fire and child abduction in northern Minnesota. Law enforcement officers had to cast a wide net for their search because the abductor of the child was not in the system. Jacob Kinn had been arrested twice and was released on probation for previous crimes of possessing, trading, and attempting to produce child sexual abuse imagery. He should have been behind bars. Instead, Kinn was able to kill a woman to get to the little girl he raped because he was free on probation. When I was an investigator um, with the sheriff's office, I received a case file from the Minneapolis Police Department. They had been uh, tracking individuals online um, that are that had been swapping um, child pornography through tracking uh, computer IP addresses. It went to his house where he uh, he was married, had a couple children. And uh, he was arrested, evidence was collected, sent to the prosecution, prosecuting attorney. And um, with the amount of evidence I had at that time, he should have been prosecuted a lot more. Then uh, while we was, he was out on conditions of release, I came across one uh, that was looking for uh, young females ages three to six to model in swimwear. And in that ad, it had the same email address as Jacob had in my initial case. Um, we answered the email. Um, the undercover officer was in there, made the hand-to-hand -hand cash transaction, and at that time we arrested him again. Uh, charges went to prosecution. 
prosecution at that time uh, wanted to bundle it up with the other one. And when all said and done was it was more or less a slap on the hands because they didn't do their job. After I'd met with the prosecutor on my second case with uh, Jacob, I had told the uh, prosecutor, I said, you know, out of all, out of all the cases I've had, um, this is probably one that we, you better do something because I can tell something is gonna happen. So time passes and uh, ended up coming back to town, uh, met up with a gal and next thing you know it, um, there's a trailer house on fire in the city of Bemidji. When the investigation was done, a child had been taken to a remote place uh, northwest of here, quite a few miles, uh, and a female died of the incident. I was brought into the Kin case um, several hours after the initial fire call. The, I believe she was five at the time, five-year-olds. Um, mother came to the line around the perimeter, the outer perimeter, and said that uh, her child had been at that residence uh, and spent the night. We started honing in on predatory offenders. He was not assigned a level of predatory offender, so that's why he was off of our radar in the beginning, because that's usually where they're not as likely to reoffend or they haven't been. Um, reviewed enough if you don't get to them within that 24 hour period 12 hour period usually that uh, they're usually um, assaulted and then killed and when they told me that she was alive it was such a heartwarming moment but it was also sad because I'm I was pretty sure what she had already went through, um, just knowing his history. And so I, I was so thankful she was alive, though. It was the best feeling in the world to get a kid back that, you know, you didn't think was going to be alive. My bill, House File 229, which is part of Protect Minnesota Kids Act, will take these predators off the street. And the more I'm learning about the child rape and torture production and imagery and that industry, this will not only take them off the street for this crime, but I believe it will prevent criminal sexual conduct cases. I believe it will have an impact on, in, on that crime as well. Uh, House File 229, which is the uh, mandatory minimums. I took the, uh, I asked our, our uh, research to give me, a, give me a mirror of the federal guidelines for child pornography, for t the crime of child pornography production, dissemination, and possession. But I've added one more, and that's because the federal guidelines have it, and, and that is receiving. In order to possess, you must receive. In order to receive, you must disseminate. And then we have the production portion of it. And I have mandatory minimums on production, on dissemination, receiving. There will be, there will be some time spent in prison for possession as well, because if they do not accept any kind of, any kind of work the prosecutor might want to give, do with them, they can charge that possession with receiving and that receives a mandatory minimum prison time. As you know, that most of these people, uh, the majority of these, uh, of, of these uh, criminals who are convicted of child, the child pornography crime of possession, they're receiving these stays or a light, a light jail, jail time. House File 226 will also will also take and put them on, require them to register as a predatory offender, and will also hold them accountable if they commit a crime, if they commit a same or similar crime during that time of probation, but also give them a criminal history point to help send them on their way to prison where they belong. With the current statute, the way it sits now, is that 90%, 90% of the, of the, over the past five years, 
90% of the convictions for child pornography has been for the possession charge. So 90% of these cases are receiving little to no jail time or a stay of adjudication. Of, the, of, of these predators who are convicted of this child rape, possession of this child rape and torture imagery, possession, dissemination, or production, of those convicted, it's been shown that approximately 50% of them are also hands-on. That means they are victimizing children. It's a slap in the face to law enforcement, but worse than that, it's spitting in the face of victims. These, these people are out there screaming for justice, screaming for help. These kids, these, these children, and, I, and I'm talking from infant to, to teenage. These kids are screaming for justice and they're constantly being victimized over and over and over again with each time these videos and these pictures are traded, viewed, all of it. For the people that I have talked to on the front lines who are doing these investigations and, uh, and more recently learning more about it, what these victims are going through, it's, when they say it's a low recidivism rate for, uh, for this type of crime, they're wrong. That's not what I'm receiving from the, the boots on the ground, and that's not what studies of uh, uh, treating victims is showing as well. This legislation is crucial in order to send the right message and to create a disincentive to those that would harm children. The minds of perpetrators are no longer normal and they are not going to be deterred by a soft approach. Men who've offended, men who are in the process of becoming deviant, will only be deterred by the significant threat of long-term jail sentences. People can go to the Child Protection League of Minnesota website and they can look up the Protect Minnesota Kids Act and the Child Protection League will guide them as to who they need to call, who they need to write, where they send the emails, all of it. So to me, we need to be loud, make it loud and clear and contact your legislators, reach out to them, light their phones up, light their computers up from the governor's office down to the last member of the house and the last member of the Senate, contact them. What I would like legislators to understand is there has been a shift within the focus of treating sex offenders, that things have moved from punitive to a treatment perspective as far as viewing men that offend through the lens of they themselves having been offended and therefore they are traumatized, they are acting out their trauma. I would say to you, that is a very dangerous perspective, and that is shifting sympathies away from survivors and onto the predators. Allow those of us that work with sex offenders to be the one to do the rehabilitation. But without significant teeth in legislation, you will not give us the material we need, as far as the leverage, to be able to work with them significantly. Minnesotans will not stand for this anymore. We will not allow our children to be victimized continuously like it has been, like it's been allowed in the past. It's got to stop. So our citizens need to stand up. We need help. We need their voices to be loud and clear. Put these laws, put the, uh, the laws that are the legislation that is contained in the Protect Minnesota Kids Act put these into law, and then we can start to work from there because there's a lot more work to do to protect our children.